original Dragon Quest, known in North America as Dragon Warrior, was a huge success in Japan. In North America, not so much. But that didn't stop Enix from porting Dragon Quest 2 to North America as Dragon Warrior 2. We were way behind on this side of the pond. I mean, the original Dragon Warrior came out three years after the original release in Japan. In fact, in 1989, when we finally got Dragon Warrior 1, Dragon Quest 3 was already out in Japan, and Part 4 was on its way. But regardless, we still got to play all four of these games over here, despite the modest sales. It's definitely a niche market, and Dragon Warrior 2 maintained the adventure RPG turn-based combat gameplay, although it was expanded upon greatly. For one thing, the plot is a little thicker. It does center around the same premise of a powerful evil wizard, this one named Hargon, unleashing a herd of minions all over the land and the hero has to assassinate him and save the world. But there are more characters and cutscenes, it's not nearly as one dimensional as its predecessor. The combat also gets an injection of depth. Like I said, it's still the text-based, turn-based system where you get into random encounters and gain golden experience points for leveling up, but now you get into it with multiple enemies at a time, as well as adding up to three members of your own party, each with strengths and weaknesses. This adds a lot more strategy to the mix, you're not just simply attacking or casting spells at the one monster in front of you. Now you're deciding who attacks what and by what means which in turn holds your interest in the game longer. If there was one thing about the first game, the grinding did get to be a bit tedious. Only thing I'd say was a drawback from the fighting is the lack of a background in an outdoor environment like in the original. Maybe it looked a little too busy with the multiple sprites on top of the background, but I think it could have been done. And I always felt like it added more ambiance to have the pitch black screen only when you were in a cave or a castle. Instead, it's like that for every battle now. Plus, there are more landscapes like a snowy mountain, a volcanic cave, and even at sea. That's right, now you can sail in a ship, which is necessary to travel to different islands, continents, and other inaccessible areas. That's another thing, the overworld map is much bigger than the original. Like I mentioned earlier, you add members to your party as the game progresses. And these other two folks, who are your prince and princess cousins of different castles, are the only ones who have spells. Princess is a weak fighter, but amazing at magic, while the Prince is a jack of both trades, but master of neither, while you, the main player, are better at physical attacks, but never learns any magic. Like in the original, much of your quest is exploration and finding items to grant you access to areas you can't get to otherwise. In most cases, you need clues from townspeople on where to locate certain objects, or what they actually do, etc. But sometimes, particularly toward the end, it gets cryptic as all hell. Most of the time this isn't the case, but some of these seem like a scam to buy the strategy guide or Nintendo power. Other returning features are the aforementioned towns where you buy weapons and items, sleep at inns to heal yourself, and schmooze with the locals to get clues. But now you can visit this place called the House of Healing, which you can use to break a curse, cure poison, or resurrect someone. So when a party member dies, they'll turn into a ghost and continue following you around. And this even includes your own main hero. You'll assume the control of one of the other two as your main party member until you resurrect them. The problem is, it costs money, and the price increases each time you bring someone back to life. Thankfully, there's an item and a spell you can get later on in the game to resurrect or cure poison for free, but the steep price hikes at the Houses of Healing are a pretty big deterrent for death. And so is the cost of all your members dying, as you'll be spawned back to your last save point, where you'll lose half your gold and the data recorder will give you shit. And that's another thing, now you can save your progress in multiple towns or castles besides the one you start in. You'll talk to the group's king where applicable, otherwise there'll be someone else there representing him in their stead. You'll save your progress, or record your deeds in the Imperial Scrolls of Honor, and you have to shut the game down by holding reset before powering off, just like the original. Having multiple save locations is crucial, just simply based on how much more land there is to venture out onto, backtracking would be a fucking nightmare otherwise. Even with the addition of portals called travel doors that transport you around to other travel doors that are scattered throughout the map. The game is also known for its high difficulty. 
particularly the last quarter of the game or so. Apparently, balancing out the difficulty was a point of emphasis toward the end of the game's development when they were making adjustments, but to meet deadlines, they had to forego balancing out the end portion of the game. Even while knowing all these cryptic hints and where you're supposed to go ahead of time, the game does get very tough. Dragon Warrior 1 certainly has plenty of charm, and it can be more enjoyable for its simplicity if you're in the mood for that, but Dragon Warrior 2 is definitely an improvement on the original, although I do prefer the first game soundtrack. It's not a game that's for everyone, but for those into this style of a game, you couldn't ask for much more at the time. So the game starts off with a cutscene taking place in the kingdom of Moonbrook. All is well until a soldier comes running in to inform the king that the evil Hargon is invading the kingdom, only to be wiped out by one of Hargon's minions. The king tries to protect his daughter, the princess of Moonbrook, but one too many minions show up and the king is struck down. With his last words, he tells the princess to hide. Before she can, the kingdom falls, but one wounded soldier manages to escape and limp his way all the way to Middenhall giving the king the bad news before croaking himself. The king tells his son, aka the Prince of Middenhall, aka you, that you need to link up with your cousins, the other descendants of Erdrich, and take Hargon down. He brings you to a treasure chest. Search it, and you'll get some gold and a copper sword. Equip the sword, and now you're on your way. Whenever you need to save your game progress, at least in this area of the game, come back to Middenhall and up the stairs to the throne room where your daddy will record thy deeds on the Imperial Scrolls of Honor, and let you know how many experience points you need to level up. The eastern part of the castle you can't access because of locked doors. Imagine, you're the prince of this fucking castle, and one whole side of the place you don't even have access to. There are two locked doors in the northwest corner, but there's also a house of healing up here, and a travel door just to the south of it, which leads to a random small island right next to a town, but it shows off what these portals are all about. To the south, just as you're exiting the castle, there's a tool shop where you can buy medical herbs for health, and antidote herbs to cure poison, and an inn that charges four pieces of gold to replenish your hit points and magic points, Although you'll never acquire any magic points, that'll be up to your future companions. If you talk to the people in town, you'll learn that to the west is the town of Leftwind, and the castles of Canock and Moonbrook have a prince and princess respectively. Although you would think the prince of this place would know the neighboring towns and the locations of where his cousins live, but it's just exposition. Let's not overanalyze this shit. Leave the castle, and now you're out in the open world. Don't venture out too far from the castle, just hang around here fighting all the weak enemies that hang out here. Slimes, big slugs, and iron ants. These enemies are weak, but at level 1, they'll work you over a bit and force you to retreat back to Middenhall every now and then to rest up and get the hit points back up. It's also a good idea to save your game while you're in the castle. After getting to level 3 or so, rest up, save, and begin traversing west along the southern coastline. Be sure not to step in the poisonous swamps, you'll lose two hit points for each step. Simply walk around this one, and you'll reach the town of Leftwind. There's a house of healing in the northeast corner, an inn that charges six gold per person in the southeast, a tool shop in the southwest that sells fairy water, which repels you from enemy encounters when you use it, or at least decreases the chances of the random encounters and the Wing of the Weaver, which will send you back to the most recent town or castle, plus the herbs. Finally, there's a weapon shop in the northwest, and at first you might be thinking, why the hell would I want to buy a club or another copper sword when I've already got one, but keep in mind you'll have others join your party in the not-so-distant future, so it may not be a bad idea to buy yourself a club, or even another copper sword if you can afford it. There's a locked door in the shop too, but it just leads to a lottery stand, no big whoop. I'll talk a little bit more about the lottery in a bit. Talking to the people in town, you'll learn that the castle of Canock is north, and the monolith to the west leads to the castle of Moonbrook. Leave town and battle some more enemies in the area as you continue leveling up. Once you reach level 4, travel north until you reach Canock Castle. You might run into some drakies, ghost mice, and wild mice during this short trek, 
They're very comparable to the big slugs, but a bit stronger. So Kanak Castle is where one of your cousins should be waiting for you. But once you get to the king, who is up in the northwest part of town, you'll learn that your cousin has already left on his quest, and the king advises for you to go find him. He can have one of several different names. In this particular playthrough, he ended up being called Bran, so that's what I'll be referring to him as throughout this video. There's a house of healing in the east, a tool shop that sells all the main necessities, and an inn that charges 8 gold per person. There's a prison in the southeast, where if you speak to them through the bars, one of them will let you know the silver key will open the silver doors. Prince Bran's sister says that Bran went to the Spring of Bravery, and a guard of the king mentions that the Spring of Bravery is to the east. Make sure that you have an antidote herb or two in your inventory, head out, stay south of the mountains near Canock, and head east where you might run into some babbles, who are similar in stature to the wild mice, but they can occasionally poison you from their attacks, which is one of the reasons you'll want to bring antidote herbs. If you do get poisoned, you'll lose a hit point from every couple of steps until you take an herb, or if you're able to get to a house of healing in one of the towns. There'll be an antidote spell later on that you can cure without having to carry anything, but for now, these herbs are all you've got. As you get closer to the cave on the far east, you can also run into a healer. They're probably the first enemies you run into that know magic, and as you probably guessed, heal is their spell of choice. Although they take more damage than any enemy introduced so far, they're not so bad on their own, but when they're paired up with other enemies, they'll prolong everything by healing the other enemies, so you'll usually want to kill the healers first if they're in a group. Cross the double bridge, stay north of the mountains, and you'll get to this cave. Aside from the standard enemies you've seen already, you'll also be introduced to the big cobras, who may end up poisoning you with their attacks. Past this first turn, there's nothing in here. Follow the linear path, and when you get to this fork, you can head this way, which will lead to a medical herb you'll find in the chest in this room. And then continuing on will lead you to a chest with some gold. Back at the fork, head north, skip the first turn, it just leads to a guy that tells you about the Spring of Bravery. And continue on where you'll reach said Spring of Bravery, and an old man is chilling beside it. He'll ask you if you're looking for the Prince of Canuck, and when you tell him yes, he'll say that he was just with him and mentioned that he was going to Middenhall. Talk to him again, answer no this time, and he'll baptize you in the Spring of Bravery and you're at full health. Grab the medical herb from the chest and head back out of the cave. Follow the same way you came to get here, but when you cross the double bridge, head straight south until you reach the coastline, and you'll see that you're at the swamp right beside Left Wind. Head east back to Middenhall, and Daddy King will tell you that you just missed Bran here too, and that he's looking for you. And he's off to Middenhall? That's where I am right now. I think this was an error, and the text should have read Left Wind. So go back out west, and when you get to Left Wind, and you glance around the area, you'll come across this guy in the inn, who turns out to be the good prince. Thanks for the wild goose chase, cuz. So now Prince Bran has joined your party, and he can also wield spells. And he has heal in his arsenal already. However, he has no experience points, so a good idea is to get him leveled up a bit. Give him the second weapon you bore earlier, and start killing some of these piddly pricks around Left Wind. Once he's leveled up to 3, he'll get the Fireball spell, which is essentially the Hurt spell from Dragon Warrior 1. Now that he can attack better, you can venture out a little more comfortably. First head east back to Middenhall, but take a turn for the south, cross the bridge, and head for this monolith way down here. When you get into the monolith, you'll meet a man there that tells you that you need different keys to open up different doors, like the one right here for example. He mentions that a cave by the lake houses one of the keys. Do some more enemy slaying, and when Bran is leveled up to about 5, head back up north to Canock, rest up, upgrade your equipment if you can afford it, and save your progress. Now head west, and you'll do battle with some new enemies like big rats, which are stronger versions of the wild mouse, and army ants, who aren't that much stronger than the iron ants, but they do call for help and bring in more army ants from time to time. This whole summoning new enemies thing is not exclusive to the army ants. 
You'll see more powerful motherfuckers using this technique later on that can really be a pain in the ass and make battles more grueling than they need to be. You'll also meet another returning enemy from the first game, the Magicians, who cast the Fireball spell, so be ready to heal up. Along the way, you'll come across this monolith called Wayland's Gate. If you enter here prior to linking up with Bran, the guards won't let you pass. Or at least they won't let you pass alone. But since you do have Bran, you can enter, but don't do it yet. Continue west first, but keep this place in mind a bit later. When you pass the mountains, head up north a bit, and then continue west where you reach the next set of mountains, and you'll reach the cave by the lake that the key man was telling you about. Here, you'll encounter new enemies like magic ants that will cast the sleep spell, which, if executed properly, will knock out a member of your party and cause them to lose a turn or two or three. This can be annoying as fuck, as you helplessly wait to wake up while taking damage, especially if it happens to your main character while your weaker members have to step up and pick up their game. In your party, only the princess has sleep, and she'll learn it when she reaches level 2. Enter the first room to get a chest with an herb, pass the next two doors, and head down this way, which will lead to a chest with some gold. Go back to the second door you passed earlier, heading west, and you'll reach the stairs to the next floor. Up here, you might run into some centipods. These fuckers have some strong defense, so it takes several shots to kill them. You might have to run away from them if your health situation gets dire. Skip the first door, and take the eastern door here for an herb. These might really come in handy here. Skip the next room, it leads to nothing, and the next room has an antidote herb, which also might come in handy if the big cobras poison you. When you reach the intersection, head west, and you'll get some gold and a wing of the weaver. Head down the eastern path of the intersection, and you'll reach a chest containing the silver key, and now you can unlock those silver doors. First, you've got to get out of here, so go back the way you came, run from battles if you have to, and once you get outside, use the Wing of the Weaver to get back to Canock where you can rest and save. Head back south to Left Wind, and there's a silver door in the weapon shop that leads to a lottery booth. I guess only those worthy enough to have a copy of the Silver Key can play the lottery in Left Wind. The lottery is basically a slot machine. A series of five shapes will scroll, you press B to stop it, and you win by matching the shapes. If you don't match anything, better luck next time. If you match two out of three, you'll get another ticket, and if you match all three, you'll get a prize, depending on the shape. Like an herb for health, a wizard wand, which is a weapon you should give the princess once she joins your party, a wizard ring, which restores magic points with a limited amount of uses, and a dragon's bane, which, when used, will ward off the stop spell and sleep spells that are used against you or the Golden Card, which will give you a discount on all items in all the shops around the world. You can't get this item anywhere else but the Lottery. Lottery tickets are often found in chests or dropped by enemies. So try your luck here, leave, and head east back to Middenhall. Over on the eastern side of the castle, there's a silver door that leads up to a staircase to the prison basement. When the prisoner walks up against the door, you can speak to him, and he asks you to unlock the door with the Jailer's key, and he'll make it worth your while. By around this time, Bran should be at level 6, where he'll learn the Antidote spell, which cures poison and renders the Antidote herbs almost useless. Of course, Bran can die and not be available to cast this spell, so they're not totally useless. Head back to Canock again, rest and save, and then head back to Gwalen's Gate. You'll enter a small cave, which is simply a corridor to a staircase that takes you across the sea to the continent of Moonbrook. There is a second staircase in here if you take the narrow hallway on the other side, but it leads to a small island with nowhere to go. Maybe they had some reason for building this staircase back in the day, I don't know. There are some enemies in this short cave, but nothing you haven't seen before. Now on Moonbrook, you'll discover Magidrakes and Smoke, both of which cast spells. The Magidrakes chant the shit out of the defense spell, which depletes defensive capabilities of your party members during a given fight, and can leave you vulnerable to higher amounts of damage, especially if they're with another enemy who will attack more. Thankfully, your defensive stats will be reset after the fight. The princess will learn the spell at level 10. Smoke chants stop spell quite a bit, which does as its name suggests. 
blocks you from using spells. If it works, anyway. Bren will learn the spell at level 8. It's not so bad if that's all that the smokes are chanting, because they won't be attacking as much. Still, it's a bummer not to be able to heal yourself with spells, so be sure to have some herbage when traversing this continent. You might also run into the occasional zombie, who takes a lot of damage and casts the spell Surround, which, when effective, puts a force field around you, making it harder for you to attack. The princess will learn the spell at level 6. You're going to travel south for quite a bit to the town of Hamlin, about the same distance Canock is to Middenhall. Once you get there, rest up at the inn, which you'll find right away, and save your game where this old man is next to the House of Healing in the northeast. Talking to people, you'll learn that Moonbrook is southwest of here, not everyone is as they appear to be, and the Cloak of Wind, which can save you from the fall of a great height, is in a tall tower somewhere. Also, a dog will follow you around when you talk to it, as if it joined your party, at least until you go back outside. There's a house of healing, a lottery stand, and a door you can't get into yet. There's a weapon shop here where you can upgrade your weapon to the chain sickle, iron spear, and eventually broadsword. There's also chain mail and a full plate for armor, as well as a steel shield. You definitely won't be able to afford all of this just yet, and some of your companions can't even equip all the shit, but for now you're going to be battling enemies in the area to save up for upgrades. Once you have enough cash, buy two chain sickles and two pieces of chain mail, one for each of you. Sell your old shit, and once you're at about level 10, save and head across the bridge to the south. On this trail, you'll meet baboons, who are some strong bastards. Megapedes, who are stronger versions of centipods, and they can poison you. And lizard flies, who aren't that strong, but they can unleash the fireball spell. Once you hit these mountains, head west, and you'll reach the castle of Moonbrook, which was attacked at the beginning of the game. You'll have to walk across the poisonous swamp to get in, and once inside, you'll see that just like Hawksness from the first game, the place is completely dilapidated, and there are enemies abound. Nothing you haven't seen before, but it's mostly made up of the stronger ones you've seen. These treasure chests are empty, and it seems like there ain't shit here. But if you try to talk with these flames, you'll realize that they're actually the spiritual forms of those who have died at Moonbrook. One of them will tell you that the Mirror of Ra can be found where four bridges can be seen at once. And the other lets you know that the Princess of Moonbrook has been cursed and turned to the form of a dog. Also, if you walk through the crack in the northwest wall, you'll see that you can walk just outside the castle. Follow it to the opening at the other corner and take the stairs down where a wounded surviving soldier will tell you that the princess's curse will be broken if she sees her reflection in the mirror of Ra. Well, you've got to find that mirror, which apparently can be found where four bridges can be seen. This is why the game came with a map poster. If you didn't have this map prior to the internet, then navigating around would be a huge pain in the balls. You basically have to do your own cartography. Thankfully, the four bridges aren't far away, so even if you had to explore by trial and error, you'd come across this soon enough. Head east from Moonbrook, and you'll find a small swamp, and the four bridges are here. And curiously, two of them are right next to each other that leads to the same land that has absolutely nothing. So now all four bridges are visible, and if you search in the upper right corner from inside the poison swamp, you'll have the mirror. Get your ass back to Hamlin, use the mirror when facing the playful dog that follows you around, and you'll break the curse and the princess will join your party. Similar to Prince Bran, the princess will have one of several name possibilities. In this particular playthrough, she goes by Varia. She's weak in terms of fighting ability, not to mention she's also at level 1, so she's got some catching up to do. But she does wield some great spells, which are a necessity. Although right now she only has one, but it's heal more, which will replenish your hit points much more than the regular heal will. Save your game, and fight some enemies for a bit to get Varia leveled up, to about 4 or so, where she'll learn the Inferno spell, which will attack all enemies in a particular group, and is more powerful than the Fireball, and way more effective than her current physical attacks, which are basically useless at this point. During this time, it's not a bad idea to buy her a magic knife, which you'll have to backtrack to Leftwind to get. 
save again, and buy a Wing of the Weavern from the tool shop, or just level Bran up to 10 so he has the return spell, which will teleport your party back to the most recent save point. Also get yourself an Iron Spear and a full plate armor for yourself once you can afford it. Head east from Hamlin until you get to a bridge. Bypass it and head north, crossing the one up here that'll take you to the other side of the mountain. Follow the linear path south until you get to the north side of the four bridges. Take either of these redundant bridges and continue taking the bridges south until you cross the one that leads directly to the Tower of Wind. There are eight floors on this tower, so you're going to do some climbing. Although you won't need to get to the tippity top, it's kind of mazy, so you'll be doing a lot of climbing up and down, back up again, etc. before you get to the main prize of this place. You'll meet the ghost rats in this tower, the strongest of the rat family, and these little bastards call for help, so they're probably going to be your first target if they come in a group. As you head down the hallway here, ignore the staircase here as well as the one in the room over here. Both lead you to the second floor, which only has a staircase that takes you to absolutely nowhere. Instead, bang a right into this nook that'll lead to a chest with an herb. Then back out and head this way and north for a staircase up to the second floor. A soldier chilling over here will tell you to avoid the edge, as walking off will send you outside the tower and you have to start all over again. Follow the linear path along the wall for the staircase up to the third floor. Follow the linear path down to the staircase here, but first head in here for some gold. Now up to the fourth, follow the path and you'll run into two staircases. If you take the second one, you'll go up three more floors where there's only one other staircase in each room, or in your path of each room anyway. So it's very linear, and you'll end up on the eighth floor, at the very top of the tower. You open the chest, and it's empty. Bullshit. So remember when there were two staircases on the fourth floor? Take the first one you came across instead. Follow the linear path to the stairs, back down to the fourth, then back down to the third, then back down to the second, and you'll reach the chest with the Cloak of Wind. Now this is what you came here for. Go back up to the fifth floor and jump off the building. This is a quicker way to escape, and then use the wing or return spell to get back to Hamlin to rest and save. Now head back down to Moonbrook but go south of the mountains alongside the castle and head west across the bridge to the Moonbrook monolith. Head out the other side and continue west through the desert. Here you'll meet Carnivogs. These pricks blow sweet scented breath that make you pass out, essentially a sleep spell. Then there's the Mummy Man, who is fairly strong but doesn't have any special attacks, and once in a while you'll run into a metal slime who is nearly impossible to beat at this point because its defense is so strong. It barely takes any damage, and then it just runs away before any kind of conclusion can happen. Plus it casts Fireball and Sleep every now and then. If you're lucky enough to take him out though, you'll get a whopping 135 experience points each. When you get to the store, head north and you'll eventually reach the Southern Dragon Horn Tower. The North Tower is on the other side of the canal. It's basically a spiral staircase that leads up six floors. If you drop into the middle, you'll wind up back at the first floor. So don't get careless if you're walking the edge. Here you'll meet Medusa Balls, who chant sleep and have the ability to attack twice in a row, which can really fuck you up if you're getting low on health. There's also the Enchanters, stronger forms of magician, who chant Fireball, Sleep, Stop Spell, and Increase, which gives you a boost to your defense, which Bran will learn at level 20, eventually. When you get to the top, make sure you have someone in the party wearing the Cloak of Wind, because the whole point of this gap in the wall when you get to the top is so that you can glide across the air, and you'll land just outside the North Tower on the other side. Don't go into the North Tower just yet. First, you're going to want to head north a bit and follow the shoreline east. It's a short trip to the town of Lionport, but you may encounter mud men who can dance a strange jig that depletes one of your member's magic points, which can really speed up the process of you heading into town for an inn. There's also the Demigosts, the stronger of the Ghost Mouse variant. This bastard can attack twice, 
and even once in a while pulls off a heroic attack which can devastate any member. Also there are magic baboons, which you would think means that they cast spells, but they don't. They can, however, call for help, which sucks. There's an inn to your immediate right that charges 60 gold per night, which you're going to want to visit first thing. A house of healing across the way from it, a lottery stand in the center of town, a marina in the northeast corner, but the old man that runs it tells you to fuck off because he doesn't trust strangers, and a weapon and tool shop in the northwest corner. Buy the clothes hiding for Varia, and if you haven't gotten the steel shield for yourself yet, do it, and sell all your old stuff. When talking to people, you'll learn that Alephgard, the kingdom from the first game, lies east. Hmm. If you cut through the shop, you'll see some shenanigans going on over here, as this lady is being harassed by two gremlins, who engage in battle with you, which is why I recommended healing up when you first get to town. These guys are pretty tough, they cast sleep, heal, and have fire breath, which affects everyone in your group, so they'll do some damage when they bust that out. After taking them out, the lady you saved brings you to her grandfather, who happens to be the old fart that was giving you a hard time at the boathouse, and he quickly changes his tune and lets you use his ship. Now you can get to the boat, but before you head out to sea, first head through this narrow corridor, unlock the silver door, and speak to this man who goes on about the lost treasure in a shipwreck. Bring it to him, and he'll repay you handsomely, so put a pin on that. Now head out, and holy shit, you're out in the ocean. So if you're referencing the map, keep in mind that the world is not flat, so when you sail off the eastern edge of the map, you'll return from the west and vice versa. And the same applies when north to south, and vice versa. This doesn't exactly match the way a globe really works, at least with the north-south dynamic, but it's a 2D map, and it's easier to navigate this way, so fuck realism. Now, this does open up the door to explore a lot of areas that you weren't able to access before, but you gotta know that the waters are not a safe haven. You'll run into all sorts of sea creatures out here, like Mana Wars, who take a little less damage to kill than their healer counterparts, but they have stronger attacks. You'll also meet Sea Slugs, which are a little more powerful than the Mana Wars, but they have a lot of intangibles. They can call for help, poison you, cause you to faint, blow a sleeping scent into your face, and pull off heroic attacks once in a while. Although that's quite a laundry list, they seldom get you with any of this stuff. It is a significantly smaller design of the kingdom, although you could say that this is just a simplified view of it, and the land itself hasn't literally changed. Either way, you're going to want to keep moving east, and one thing about the land that has changed is that the mountains by the mountain cave are no longer blocking the lake west of Tantacle Castle, because you can travel north of them and get straight to the castle, or you can take the route south of Garenham and Edric's Cave. Once you're at Tantacle, you'll notice that the town of Breconary that was once right beside the castle is now presented as being part of the same landscape to the west of the castle. This is where you'll want to go for weapons in the northwest, buy the iron helmet from here when you can afford it, the inn is just south of it, and the tool shop is on this tiny island over the bridge across from the inn. There's also an old man in the booth here, go to him if you're ever cursed, and a locked wooden door up north, but we'll have to come back for that later. To learn from this bloke that the shipwrecked treasure that the lion port dude was talking about is somewhere in the northern seas. In the castle proper, you've got a house of the healing on the far west where you can also save your progress. The reason this guy's doing it? Well, if you go into this room up the stairs and in the weapon shop, you'll notice the king is being a complete pussy and locked himself in his room. He won't even save your deeds on the Imperial Scrolls of Honor. They send in a verdict, my ass. The inn is cheap, but you can save gold by simply utilizing this guy in the House of Healing that restores all your magic points. Heal up with spells, and just replenish your MP here. Once you're rested and saved, fight enemies around Tantacle and in the western region of Alephgard until you level yourself up to about 17, and while you're out, set sail north between Alephgard and Lionport. Stay just against the coastline near where Garenham is, and you'll come across this patch of water that looks different from the rest. 
Press up against it, do a search, and you'll get the treasure. All the treasures. So head back to Lionport, talk to the guy in the marina, and in exchange for the treasures, he'll give you the echoing flute. Now head back to Alephgard to continue leveling up, and if you decide to battle some stronger enemies during this, head to the eastern part of Alephgard, either by sailing south of Tantagal and east of Charlock Castle, or by heading south of the Swamp Cave. Here you'll meet Poison Lilies, who can breathe poison, and the Orcs, who have no specialties, but are brutal bastards with physical attacks. If you travel to the monolith in the far southeast portion of Alephgard, you'll meet this grumpy old fart that won't deal with you because he doesn't believe you're actually a descendant of Erdrick. Around this time, Faria should reach level 8 where she'll learn the Repel spell, which is like fairy water, it decreases the chances of enemy encounters. Once you're leveled up, it's on to Charlock Castle, which is right across the river from Tantagel. But the ship is back on the other side, and you'll have to go back and sail up the channel in the southern part of the continent to get there. Or travel east through the Swamp Cave, where Princess Gwalyn was held captive back in the day, and then back across the bridge. Or you can simply cast the return spell, and the boat will be docked right outside the castle, and you can just hop right over it. So Charlock is not quite the same as it was either. The whole front courtyard area has been wiped out completely, and it's downstairs immediately. Follow the linear path on the first floor, and throughout the castle you'll meet enemies like Gorgons, who are stronger variants of the Medusa Ball, who can chant Surround. Defense, Sleep, and Increase, the last of which is a real dick of a spell for them to use because their defense is already high enough, killing these guys is a fucking chore. Also, there are Saber Tigers, who can hurt you pretty bad, especially with their double attacks. An ability to sometimes unleash a heroic attack. And then there are Dragonflies, which are far more dangerous than real-life Dragonflies. Not to mention their Pallet Swap Lizard Flies. These fucks, on the other hand, breathe fire, which we all know sucks because it hurts all members of your party. The stairs leading down to the second floor basement will lead you to a long-winded spiral-shaped hallway, which is again a linear path to a staircase down. The third floor basement will lead you to your first fork in the road, and honestly, it doesn't really matter whether you take these first stairs or the second stairs, you'll still end up coming up on the fourth floor basement here on one side of the room, or the other. Either way, you want to head for the center of the room and take these stairs going back up to the third floor basement. And you'll go through some more rooms that are completely linear. Only one other staircase and it'll lead you to this chest where you get the Sword of Erdrick. Alright, this thing is a classic, so equip it. Now go back where you came from to the fourth floor basement and you'll go through some more rooms with another staircase on the other side. Just follow the path until you get to the throne room where the Dragon Lord once fought your descendant. Never mind the door behind the barricade for three reasons. Number one, at this point, unless you've been grinding away with leveling up, you don't have the step guard spell that lets you walk over these barriers without losing 15 hit points per step. Bran learns this at 17 and Varia at 21. Number two, it's a locked wooden door, so you need the golden key, and you don't have it. So you're not going to be able to get through here anyway, at least for now. And number three, the prizes in here aren't even fucking worth it anyway. All you do is get a medical herb, some gold, a lottery ticket, and a wing of the weaver. So when you do get the golden key later, don't even bother coming back here. It's not worth the aggravation. Anyway, walk around the perimeter of the room, and you'll come across the dragon lord. Really? Well, kinda. He's the descendant of the Dragon Lord, and although he wants power and to rule the world and blah blah blah, he wants to see Hargon die too. And if FDR and Stalin can be allies, why can't you and the Dragon Lord? He won't do anything besides give you some guidance, but it's still good shit to know, so when he asks you for help, say yes, and you won't be killed like you were in Dragon Warrior 1 for doing this. Instead, he tells you that once you collect the five crests, visit the shrine of Rubis. And now you're done with the castle, so cast the outside spell, which sends you back outside in any dungeon or cave you're in. Hopefully you have at this point. Brian learns it at level 12, Varia at 17, and then return, rest up, and save your game.
Your main objective now is to get your hands on the five crests the Dragon Lord told you about. Fight some monsters until you're at least level 18, and then sail south of Charlock. Head east, and then south down this river until you get to the small island with the lighthouse. Enter it. This place is a goddamn maze, and there are some tough enemies in here like undead and gold orcs, both of which have strong attacks, so be ready to heal up. When you first walk in, you gotta walk all the way around the perimeter of the building. Head down this way, take your first left, head north, and then the first floor to your left from here will put you in four conjoined rooms, each with a staircase going up. First, head up into this nook for a chest of some gold, and then take the stairs in the southwest corner of the room. Follow the linear path to the next set of stairs, using the inside line to minimize your steppage. Then take the next set of stairs, head down, and bang a right to get a chest of gold. Then head back and go up this way and bang a left to the stairway here, keeping in mind that walking off the edge will send you back outside the lighthouse. After going up the stairs, follow the linear path to the next staircase, then unlock this massive red door that the silver key can open up for some reason. Head up and follow the linear path to the next set of stairs. Then head down this way where this gremlin runs away. And after following him, you'll meet this old man who promises to lead you to a crest. Follow him down these stairs at the bottom corner. Continue down the path, following the old fuck to the next staircase down, and then go up six feet to another staircase down. Walk down six feet to another staircase down, and then walk to the edge here to another staircase going down. And then you'll enter this room where the old man tells you to take what's in the chest. Heal yourself up before opening the chest, because it turns out to be a ruse. And you'll get into a fight with three gremlins, one of which was the old man in disguise. Once you take them out, you'll get the sun crest. One down, four to go. Cast outside, or just walk off the edge. And cast return to get back to Tantago, save and restore your health. Now you've got a bit of a trek to get out of Alephgard since it's surrounded mostly by land. And you can't carry your ship across the land to the other side. So now sail south of Alephgard as if you were going to go back to the lighthouse, but sail west as soon as you're out, and once you hit the coastline, follow it north until you reach the canal between the two horn towers and sail through it. Continue west until you'll end up eventually reaching the continent of Middenhall where you started. Sail south until you see the tiny islands, and just south of that is the island we're targeting. During this trip, you may run into Hawkmen and Gargoyles. Gargoyles are slightly more powerful than their Hawkman cousins, but interestingly, the Hawkmen are better equipped with magic. They both have stop spell, but the Hawkman also has heal. Because of the mountains and shoals, there's only one way to get onto the island, and that's through this canal on the west side. Park your boat, head north, and you'll find the castle of Ostafair. It won't take long, but there are some tough enemies on this island like evil trees who chant stop spell and do that same jig dance that mud men do that wipe out magic points. Gases, which cast stop spell, sleep, and surround. Horks, who can poison you and put you to sleep with its disgusting breath. And finally sorcerers, the most powerful of the magicians, who chant stop spell, increase, and the dangerous firebane, which attacks all members of your party. Bran learns the spell at level 18, and it works on all enemies in the fight. At the castle, you'll walk along a long hallway that encompasses the perimeter. If you go all the way around to the other side, you'll find a travel door right next to a wooden door. The travel door takes you to the monolith in the south of Middenhall, although it's behind the wooden door you couldn't access before, so you still have no access to it. And since you can't get into this other wooden door yet either, instead just head through this way to get into the castle. Before you speak with the king, heal up. I know it sounds crazy, but trust me. There's an inn to the west, a fortune teller just north of it who tells you that what you're looking for is north, a weapon shop just south of it, buy the magic armor for Bran, and once you're rested, now talk to the king. 
He'll ask you to entertain him and then unleash what appears to be a dog out of its cage, but it turns out this sprite is just representing a saber lion. This fucker is more powerful than the saber tiger, but if you come into this fight maxed out, you'll be able to take him down. As a reward for your victory, the king will hand over the moon crest, so it's two down, three to go. The wizard dude behind the counter here will mention that playing the echoing flute in a tower will lead you to a crest. Miss Prisoner will tell you that the town of Zahan in the southern ocean has a man named Torval who has the golden key. You'll have to cast Step Guard to avoid the swamp damage. Bran learns this at level 17 and Varia at 21. Otherwise, you'll have to sacrifice a few hit points, or you can just not bother since you just read what he has to say just now in this video. Save and rest, and head out. Once you're out of the canal, sail south and you'll come across this tiny island with a monolith. Ignore it and continue south for just a bit, and then head east until you reach this tiny island. During the trip, you might meet the Vampires, who have powerful physical attacks, not to mention that they attack twice in a row, and they can call for help. Don't worry about the monolith here either, just go to the town here, and you'll be welcomed to Zahan. First thing you'll notice about this place is that you're surrounded by chicks. All their husbands have gone away fishing, so you and Bran are probably getting all horned up while Varia just rolls her eyes. There's an inn to the west, a tool shop to the east, and a house where a wizard lives with a barrier all across the floor. Damn, this guy's got a hell of a security system. The step guard spell will allow you to walk along the barrier, but you need an item to explore the whole area here, so don't bother yet. Talking to some of the townsfolk, you'll learn that holding up the moon fragment will raise the tides, and that is the only way to access a certain cave out in the sea. This dog will bark and leads you to this spot here. If you stand in front of him and search the area, you'll find the golden key, which will unlock any of the wooden doors. So now off to another land. First, sail north just a bit. Turn west until you reach the little sand island with the trees in the middle. Remember it, but for now you'll find a peninsula right after. You can park here and walk the rest of the way to town, which isn't a really long walk, but I'd stick to the sea and minimize my time on the land because the enemies are stronger there. And they include the Goopies, who are pretty strong and can call for help. When you arrive in town, which is called Wellgarth, you'll discover it's actually an underground town that you can't access unless you have the gold key. But thankfully we just picked that up, so you can enter. There's a weapon shop to the north, which has the light sword, a good weapon to scarf up, and the mink coat, which is a strong armor Varia can wear, but it's expensive as fuck, and we can get some armor that's even better for free. You'll just have to wait a bit. There's an item shop to the west, an inn at the southwest that's 25 gold per person, a house of healing in the southeast, and in the dead center is another tool shop and a lottery stand. Go in the western shop, and you'll notice there's a blank item. And you can tell that this guy is dealing some black market shit. He says that this is an expensive item, but doesn't outright tell you it's 2,000 gold. However, it's worth it. Once you buy it, he tells you that you didn't get this here, and then turns out that you've got the jailer's key. So now you can unlock all the cell doors, including the jail right here in the northeast part of town. First, you need the golden key to unlock the first door, and then the jailer's key will get you in here where this old chap tells you that Hargon is in Rome, and that you need the Eye of Malroth to find the road. Talking to people in town, you'll learn that Don Mahone is in a place called Toon. The charm of Rubis will see through Hargon's deception. There was once a road northwest of here that led to Rome. Hmm, that's good to know. And that the Jailer's Key might be sold here, which hints you at what the shady shop owner is up to. This guard says that he locked up Rogue Fastfinger, but he escaped, and you can walk in on this chick minding her own business in her room after unlocking it with the Silver Key. Now on to another town. Continue west until you reach this continent with a tiny island to the south of it. Follow the coastline up and you'll see a town chilling by the water. Park your boat and head in. It's a short trip, but you might run into Titan Trees, which are actually weaker versions of the evil trees that we met earlier. But they don't cast spells, although they do the strange jig that takes away magic points. 
There's also basilisks, which are stronger than big cobras, and they can also poison you. The gold orcs are just stronger versions of the regular orcs, but they are deadly at this point. In the town of Baran, there's a weapon shop in the southeast that has the Shield of Strength, which can be equipped by Bran, but it has an expensive 21,500 gold, so you shouldn't be able to afford this yet, but you'll be coming back to this town later. There's a tool shop behind this same counter that's run by this lady, a lottery stand right across from the shop, and in to the southwest that charges 30 gold ahead, and an old man that saves your progress in the northwest. Talking to people here, you'll learn from this lady that you can have the water flying cloth made if you can find the magic loom and the dew's yarn. And this old man tells you that the leaf of the world tree can resurrect ghosts. In the northeast part of town, a prisoner is held captive. Unlock the cell door with your newly acquired jailer's key and cast step guard before walking over these super barriers cause they'll wipe out 30 hit points for each step you take. Fuck that. Anyway, the prisoner says that you might as well use that cell door over there to the left since you came this far. You can access it through this little building by going around, but you don't want to go through the portal on the other side just yet. Leave for now, and if you head up north to the monolith here, you'll access a trio of travel doors that'll take you to either Gwalen's Gate on the left, which you couldn't access before because of the gold door. The monolith near the leaf of the world tree is in the center, and the monolith connecting Roan to Moonbrook is on the right. Now that monolith near the leaf of the world tree also has three travel doors. Dead center is the one that connects to Baran. On the left you'll end up at the monolith north of Lionport. And on the right you'll go to the monolith in the southeast of Alifgard. You can use these as shortcuts, but for now sail back to the little island with the tree I mentioned earlier, near Welgar. Walk onto the tree, do a search, and you'll pick a leaf of the world tree, which, like the old man before said, will revive someone in your party that died when used. You can always come back and pick more from the tree, but you can only carry one for the whole party at a time. It's a good idea to always have one on you, so you don't have to make a trip to the house of healing and pay out the ass. So whenever you use one up, head back to the world tree at your earliest convenience. I always thought this was one of those cryptic clues of the game. Yeah, this guy mentions the world tree having this powerful leaf, but there's no hint as to there being a special tree on an island like this. Who the hell would have even known that he was talking about a literal tree anyway with the way these items are named? Anyway, I digress. It's on to the next town. Get back on your ship and continue heading west, following the mountainous coastline. You'll eventually reach a river, which if you take it, will lead you to a fork. The one on the left leads you to a patch of land that gets you nowhere, and the one on the right will take you to within arm's reach of the town of Toon, which is your target destination. The problem is, you can't reach it from here, so fuck this river. Instead, continue following the coastline to the next river, which will lead you to land here. Now you have to walk the rest of the way to Toon, and it's no easy task. First, you have to head west a little more until you reach the swamp, head north from here and follow the path between the mountains and through the hills. Second off, you have some tough bastards to deal with, like hunters who don't have special attacks, but they pack a punch. Puppet men who are stronger than the mud men, but their jigs cause more MP to be decreased, plus they cast increase. Hibabongos, who unlike the magic baboons actually do cast spells, surround and defense, plus they can unleash heroic attacks. And grab boopies, who are stronger versions of goopies, and these guys also call for help. Eventually you'll reach Toon, which is a pretty small village, but there's more than meets the eye. There's a house of healing in the southeast, a weapon shop in the southwest, get the magic armor here for Bran, an inn to the north that charges 40 gold per person, and a tool shop neighboring the inn. In the center of town, there's a building locked with a gold door, so use your newly acquired key to unlock it. Here you'll meet Don Mahone, the man who can make the water flying cloth for you. But he needs two items, the magic loom and the dew yarn. Talking to other people here, you'll learn that the Tower of the Moon holds a piece of the moon. This rogue fast finger guy has the Watergate key, 
and that the riverbed would be filled again if only the water gate could be released. If you head north of town, you'll notice that there's more to explore up here, including a cell door you'll need to unlock with the prison key. It leads to the locked water gate. Put a pin on that. So now that you have the silver, gold, and prison keys, you can do some backtracking and unlock some doors while leveling yourself up at the same time. First off, now that we know that Rogue Fastfinger has the Watergate key, and that Fastfinger escaped from the jail in Welgarth, you're supposed to assume that he's still hiding out in the area, cause you know, people like to hang out where they've escaped. So go back to Welgarth and unlock the empty cell. Assuming that this empty cell is the prison that belonged to Fastfinger, you're also supposed to assume that he busted through the walls, so one of them has to be defective. So press into them, and you'll reveal Fastfinger hiding behind the wall. He'll offer the Watergate key as a bribe to keep silent on his whereabouts, which is pretty fucked because this is what he was caught stealing in the first place. Why wasn't he thoroughly searched? So now we'll sail east until you reach Zahan and go back to the wizard's house that's laid out with barrier carpeting. Cast Step Guard and walk to the western portion of the house where you'll find the magic room. Don't bother with the eastern side, there's nothing in the chest here. So now sail north to Ostafair, and remember that gold door I mentioned that was behind the shop that you can only get to by going around the perimeter walls of the castle? This lets you into the shop where you can raid the chests of the armor of Gaia and the magic knife put the armor on and have Varia wield the magic knife. The shopkeeper gets a little pissy about you sneaking in and stealing his shit, but screw it, you've got a world to save. These people should be donating this stuff to you anyway. Now head through the travel door to take the shortcut to Middenhall, although it's really not that much shorter than going back and sailing directly to the castle. Plus you'll get stronger enemies than the piss ants you'll deal with on your walk back to Middenhall. But anyway, at the castle, there's the gold door near the silver door that leads to the prison. That prisoner we mentioned earlier that says he'll offer you something in exchange for his freedom. Well, with the prison key, open the door and he'll tell you that the crest of life can be found on the road to Rome. Unlocking the gold door below, and then using step guard, and then using the prison key will get you access to this prisoner who must be a menace to society based on the security system in place. Before doing any of this though, you should be healed up. When you do talk to the prisoner, you'll end up in a battle with an evil clown. He's a strong attacker and has the fire bane, increase, and decrease spells. But the biggest problem is the heal all spell, which completely replenishes his health and renders everything you've done in the fight up to that point pointless. The heal all spell does come in handy big time though when Varia reaches level 15, especially since by this point all of your party has some pretty high max HP where heal more becomes less effective, because you have to take it a few times each. After taking him down, you'll get the Staff of Thunder, which you should hand over to the Princess. It basically functions as an Inferno spell if the item is used during battle. Use this in place of normal attacks by the Princess, and it enables you to attack with her a lot more often since it'll save you a ton of magic points, which you can use for healing instead. The gold door will lead you to a small room with some chests. There's a medical herb, some gold, a wing of the Weavern, and the token of Erdrich. And now you've got your proof of lineage. Take a short walk back to Cannock Castle. There's a gold door just west of the House of Healing with an old man guarding a chest that contains the shield of Erdrich. Take this, equip it, and sell the old one. Now head back to Varia's hometown of Hamlin. There's a small building that's locked with a gold door. The staircase inside will lead you down to a cell with some gremlins. Unlock it with the prison key, and engaging them will start a battle with two Oswards, which are more powerful gremlins that breathe fire, cast heal more, fire bane, stop spell, and sleep. Plus they call for help when you fight them in the wild. You'll have your hands full here, but should be able to take them down. You'll get nothing for defeating them, but if you search the ground, you'll find the water crest. How the hell was I supposed to know that? Continuing onward, you'll come across an old man who mentions a great wizard in a cave in the sea that'll come to you when you have the five crests. If you visit the town of Breconary in Tanticle Castle, there's a gold door to the north. Inside, a woman will tell you that the Dewey Yarn is located on the third floor of the Northern Horn Tower 
Also in Breconary, you can unlock the gold door in the weapon shop where the king is hiding out. All he does is confirm that he's a pussy. Again, there's nothing actually useful about coming in here. And then, of course, there's the bullshit treasure chests in Charlock Castle that I already mentioned. Instead, travel to the southeast portion of Alfgard where this old grump resides. Now that you have the token of Erdrich, he's happy to deal with you, and he hands over the helmet of Erdrich. Equip it, and sell your old one next chance you get. From here, sail west to the Dragon's Horn Towers, go into the north one, and climb up to the third floor where the lady mentioned the Dew Yarn is. It's always somewhere random, so search the entire floor until you find it. So now that you have the Dew Yarn and the Magic Loom, you can go back to Toon, give Don Mahone both of these items, and he starts making the Water Flying Cloth but you'll have to come back for it later. In fact, he'll always tell you that he needs a day or two no matter how often you sleep. The only way to make this work is to save and shut down the Nintendo. Next time you restart, he'll give you the cloth. There's also a trick where you can get two by saving, restarting the game, continuing, and finding the Dew Yarn and Magic Loom all over again and repeating the process. And now that you have the Watergate key, you can go back to that building hidden in the outskirts of town that leads to the Watergate. Unlock it, and the water will flood the dried up river that blocked off the riverbed. So now you can sail down this little island which houses the Tower of the Moon. Here you'll meet the ghouls, the strongest of the zombie family. They have vicious attacks and can cast fireball, which honestly you'd rather deal with than their normal attacks. The evil eyes, who can put you to sleep with their breath, and dance a jig to take away MP. And mummies, who are stronger than the mummy men, who can knock you unconscious with their attacks. When you first walk in, head straight south to the staircase against the wall. Then take the set of stairs up that are nearby, next floor basically the same exact movement to the next one, and then head east to another staircase up. Now there are more stairs that lead upwards to the top of the tower, but you don't want to go there, cause the chest at the top gives you jack shit. Instead, open up this red door with the silver key and take the stairs down. Take the next staircase right after that down again, there's another that's right there, and then another one, and now bam, you've found the chest with the moon fragment. Now cast outside, and then return to save and rest. Now that you have the moon fragment, you can raise the tides, so go back to Osterfair and sail just to the southwest of it where you'll find this tiny sea cave. Get up close and use the moon fragment to raise the tide over the shoals, and now you can enter the cave. Here you'll first meet the Mega Knights, stronger versions of the Undead, and Metal Hunters, who aren't the strongest enemies you've seen in the game, but they do attack twice consecutively and have really strong defense, so it takes a little while to put them away. Plus they can pull off the heroic attacks now and again. Don't step on the lava unless you absolutely have to, and there will be parts where this is the case, like right away. You lose a hit point from each step, although if one of you is equipped with the water cloth, that person is safe. There's a fork in the road right away. If you go north, you'll traverse across all kinds of lava, and probably get into a tough fight or two. All for a hundred gold or so in this chest. Not worth it. Instead, go south and then west on your first turn. Skip the first two doorways and enter the north one here for a medical herb in this chest, if you have the space for it. Continue on the path for a staircase down, skip the first two doorways, and take this one southward. Then skip the next one, head north through this door, and monitor your health as you walk across the lava and go down another staircase. Unlock this door with the silver key, and skip all the doorways to the end. There's a chest with a little gold up here, and then continue south, following the perimeter until you hit up another staircase down. And head west until you get to the far wall, and head north. Unfortunately, you've got more lava to contend with. Take the staircase down, follow the path between the lava, and you'll come across a chest with the Eye of Malroth. There's a lot of territory in this cave you didn't explore, but there's nothing in here that you need, so cast outside, and then return, save, and rest. Now head back to Baran, and it's time to go through that door that the prisoner mentioned. When you walk into this building, you've got a prison door with some super barricade on the floor that leads to a travel door. 
It'll transport you to this random patch of land surrounded by mountains just west of Welgar. It seems like a dead end, but if you use the Eye of Malroth while standing in the swamp area, then a cave opens up. And needless to say, you should cast Step Guard before walking here. You'll meet quite a few new enemies in here like the Orc King, the strongest of the Orcs that casts Heal More. The Berserker, a stronger version of the Hunter who has very potent physical attacks. The Flame, who breathes fire and calls for help. The Dark Eye, the more powerful version of the Evil Eye that also casts Surround. Dances a strange MP draining jig and puts you to sleep with its breath. The Attack Bot, stronger than its Metal Hunter counterpart who has devastating attacks and a really high defense level. The Magic Vampirus, stronger than the regular Vampirus, who breathes fire and casts defense and sleep. The Silver Bat Boon, who has sleepy breath and casts fire bane and the annoying heal all. Hargon's Knight, the strongest of the undead soldiers. This prick casts heal more and defense, and also attacks twice consecutively and has an occasional heroic attack. And the Green Dragon, making its return from the original. But it's tougher this time out, and of course, breathes fire. For some reason though, this is the only enemy in the game outside of the final bosses without a pallet swap cousin. If you round the first corner down, you'll enter a staircase to the basement where there's nothing but horks. And the place is infested because you end up in a battle in what seems like every fucking half step you take. So casting the repel spell will help. In the southeast corner of the room is a chest with the life crest. Once you have it, cast outside, and then either sail or take the travel doors back to Middenhall or Ostafair, because the monolith you're looking for is in between both. And here, you'll walk down a series of staircases until you get here, where, because now that you have all five crests, the spirit of Rubus will call to you, and you'll be awarded the charm of Rubus. Now go back to Baran, and back to the cave to Roan, although it would probably behoove you to heal and save first. Once you're back in, head east like you were gonna go back to the basement, but skip the stairs and hug the outside wall as you continue east. If you veer off just a bit, you might run into one of these annoying ass pits that pop out of nowhere. This is a recurring theme of this fucking cave. Take these stairs up and immediately bang a right through here, skipping these doorways till you get to the third one. Head down and take these stairs up. Head east and follow the corridor down, skipping the southern doorway and keep going until you reach the staircase. Take the next immediate staircase up and you'll get the armor of Erdrich. Put that shit on. Now go back to where you came to the third floor and bypass the stairs you first entered and head north, bypassing all the side doors. You'll eventually have to go east, head up the stairs here, take the immediate staircase up, and here's the first of two major pain in the ass areas of this cave. This room has a shitload of pits. You only have to dodge a few if you know what direction to go in, but this trial and error method of finding where to go, where all the pits are, and having to drop down a floor and start again is complete bullshit. But you do want to drop down one of these pits, at least once anyway. There's one just under the stairs you came in, and you'll find yourself in a huge ass open room. Go to the southwest area of the room, and you'll find another hidden pit. This one leads you into a room with a chest containing the Thunder Sword. Equip it immediately. Walk to the end of the room for another hidden pit that will take you to a room where you'll have to walk up for another hidden pit that will take you to the first room. Head back to the original pit room, and this time go south two paces, west two paces, and then south all the way to the wall, and follow the wall east until you get to the staircase up. Now you're in a hallway maze of illusions. You have to take a specific path in a specific order, or you'll end up right back where you were, kind of like the World 4 and 7 castles in Super Mario Bros. First, head into the eastern door, then head up this way for the eastern door on this side, then continue east and head north at this fork here. Bear left at the fork up here, and continue north until you reach an intersection. Head east, and you'll reach the stairs that lead you to the top of the snowy mountain of Rome. Hargon's castle is walkable from here, but you've got to level your way up to at least 35. I like to go all the way up to 40 just to be on the safe side. But to do that, you're going to need a spot to save and rest. 
Unfortunately, there's one up ahead, although you have to deal with new enemies like the Cyclops, a powerful bastard that can unleash heroic attacks, the Giant, an even stronger version of the Cyclops, the Blizzard, stronger than its flame cousin and can cast defense, and the extremely frustrating defeat spell, which doesn't usually work, but when it does, it automatically kills off a party member and can sometimes kill more than one in a single swoop. This isn't so bad if you've already reached the monolith on Roan, which I'll explain why in a bit, but it's still a kick in the pants. Bram learns the defeat spell at level 23, but similar to your enemies, it's ineffective way more than half the time. Also there are gold bat boons, stronger than the silver ones, who breathe fire, put you to sleep with their breath, and cast fire bane and sacrifice, which does what its name suggests, kills off the attacker in exchange for wiping out its target. This is just as much of a pain in the ass when the enemy has it, as much as it is useless for yourself to use when Bran reaches level 28, especially since it isn't guaranteed to even work. And finally, there are Bullwongs. These big bastards are strong, they can attack twice in a row, they breathe fire, and they can chant Explodet, which is a really strong attack spell that'll hurt each member of your party. The good news is, once Varia reaches level 19, she learns the spell, and it does some serious damage and will attack all enemies. Very useful. Follow the mountains, and you'll reach the previously mentioned monolith, where an old man will save your progress, and restore your health and magic points, and resurrects any fallen members of your party. And since you're not going to be hitting up any shops for the rest of the way, your gold amount is no big deal. So even if you do lose your entire party to one of these dickheads with a defeat spell or some shit, it's not a big deal to just get sent back here. There's also a one-way gate back to the travel door that connects Baran to outside the cave to Rome. Unless you missed something important, I don't recommend going through here at all, because you'll have to go back through the cave to Rome, and nobody wants to do that. Although, you can cast Return and get back here, just as long as you don't save your deeds anywhere. So there's that. Fight some monsters in the area, go back to the monolith for a rest and save, rinse, lather, repeat, until you feel ready to take on Hargon. And like I said, I like to go to 40, although you don't need to go that high. And you can max out at 50. There are also two shitty spells that Varia learns during this time period. When she reaches level 23, she'll learn Open, which lets you open doors without needing a key. But why the hell would you waste MP to open doors you should already have a key to in the first place? And Chance, which she learns at level 25, which is a complete surprise. It'll either cast a random spell, or it'll hurt you. What's the point of risking yourself for the possibility of using a spell you might not even need? Why not just cast the spell you actually want to use? Fuck that spell. Anyway, once you're beefed up, you can head to Hargon's castle. Follow the perimeter of the mountains counterclockwise, and don't worry about running from fights to save hit points. You'll be able to get another refresh soon. Once you reach this hilly area, head north and you'll reach Hargon's castle. What the fuck? This is Middenhall! What the hell's going on here? Did I warp back to the beginning and the game is an infinite loop? Well, no. This is just a bullshit illusion of Hargon's. To break this illusion, use the charm of Rubis. But before you do that, go to the inn and rest. Even though this is an illusion, you can still sleep here, as well as stock up on herbs at the tool shop for some extra healing options. After using the charm of Rubis, you'll be transported to Hargon's castle legit. Now you've got to find your way through here, but there's no obvious points of entry. Your first instinct would probably be to talk to these two gold bat boons which spawns a fight. You think maybe defeating these creatures would open up a door or trigger an event of some kind, but nothing happens, so don't bother engaging with these dickheads, there's no point. If you use step guard, head left, and then use step guard again to go in here, you'll see that there's a prison door over here that's normally blocked out of sight. So instead of going over here at all, just head straight north at the outset behind the throne, use step guard, and use the prison key to unlock the door. Use step guard again to walk over this barrier, and don't bother making your way to either side hallway, because these chests here are empty. Just unlock the golden door, use step guard again to get across the barrier, and then step guard again once you cross onto the safe path here. 
walk onto the center square, and while this is cryptic as fuck to figure out on your own, the Eye of Malroth is needed once again, in this specific spot, and it'll transport you to the next floor of the castle. The only new enemy you'll find here before the bosses are the Mace Masters, a stronger version of the Evil Clown, who are pretty strong, but their magic is nuts. They have Defense, Increase, Explodet, Defeat, and Revive, which brings back fallen comrades during a battle, forcing you to start the shit over again. This is also a spell you should have at this point. Bran learns it at level 25, which makes him very important to keep alive. Head north and through this doorway to a staircase up, then follow the linear path to the northwest part of the next room. Then follow the linear path around the perimeter of the room, and just before you take the next staircase, you'll be brought into a boss battle with Atlas, a Cyclops cousin. He unleashes devastating attacks and usually does double attack on someone, so have your sidekicks heal you up, because neither of them can do much with their attacks or spells against him, although Bran can get very modest damage. Fight with him if everyone's health is high. After finishing him off, heal up, take the stairs up, in this room head all the way to the west and then north in this little nook for another staircase that's guarded by a boss, in this case a Bazuzu or a new Batboon variety. He has vicious spell attacks, so once again use your sidekicks to heal up as you take hits. When you're done with him, heal up and it's onward and upward. And also keep in mind if you end up getting wiped out and start back at the castle, all these mini bosses will be gone when you come back here as long as you don't shut off the game after saving. You want to do this in one sitting. That'll really help matters when taking on Hargon. By the way, we've got another mini boss by the next set of stairs which is dead ahead from the previous one. This is time Zarlox, another form of Bullwong. This pain in the ass has fierce attacks, fire breathing, and powerful magic, including the annoying as fuck heal all, which essentially hits the reset button for things on your end. Once again, attack while using the sidekicks mainly for healing, and you especially want Bran to survive so as to potentially resurrect someone that might die after the fight is over. When you're done with him, heal up, go up the stairs, cast Step Guard, and walk into the throne room to meet Hargon. He asks if you know who he is, either way it triggers the battle. Utilize the same attack strategy as the previous bosses, and as long as he doesn't use heal all, all that much, you'll finish him off soon enough. Once you do, he'll reveal that you've got a more powerful being to deal with, Malroth. Before you even move, heal up completely, and then as you move downward, Hellfire reigns and Malroth appears. He's basically a stronger version of Hargon. Attack, heal, and hope he doesn't use heal all before you're able to drain his health completely. When you finally finish him off, you'll get a message from Rubis congratulating you for ridding the world of evil, resurrects any of your fallen comrades, and then you're immediately sent outside. Now head back to Middenhall. Don't worry, with Hargon and Malroth dead, you won't run into any more monsters. Back home, the king will congratulate you and offer you the throne, which you'll have to say yes, or he'll ask you again until you do. He'll lead a cheer for you, and the credits roll. The series would continue with Dragon Warrior 3, but I'll probably get around to reviewing that one in 2038. And that wraps up this edition of Aqualung's Game Reviews. See you next time.